our first speaker is an Orange County Superior Court judge. He's running for Orange County Superior Court Judge Office 28, <clears throat> a native of Orange County for nearly 20 years. Eric Scarborough has dedicated his career to serve and protect the people of Orange County. As Senior Deputy District Attorney for Orange County, Eric has handled thousands of criminal cases at all stages of criminal litigation. For the past 12 years, he has specialized in prosecuting heinous crimes and has tried more than 80 cases. Please welcome Mr. Eric Scarborough. Hello everyone, good evening. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm not used to speaking into a microphone. Usually when I'm talking, I'm talking to 12 people, so bear with me a little bit with this. I would like to tell you first why judicial races are important. I'm going to be brief about that, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Most people don't understand what judicial races are. In the state of California, there's only two ways to become a judge. The first one is by appointment of the governor. You can count on your hand in the past four administrations how many prosecutors have been appointed by the governors of California. That's it. There are currently 11 seats. In the next couple months, there'll be 13 seats up for appointment. But the governor is going to have an opportunity to pick and choose who he wants to be the judge. This election is very unusual because the only other way to become a judge in the state of California is to run. This is unprecedented. In the history of Orange County, we've never had nine seats open. Usually it's one or two seats, maybe three, but nine is unheard of. Several prosecutors, we've gotten together, we realize this is the time. If we want to preserve our society, if we want to keep things safe, we decided to run for judge. That's part of the reason why I'm here today. Like you heard, I'm an Orange County native. I was born and raised here. My parents came to Orange County because of opportunity. They wanted their children to have an opportunity to excel, to grow, to get all the things that they didn't. My parents come from very humble backgrounds. They started a small business. It was a family affair. We all worked. From a very young age, since I was 11 years old, I've had a job. I've learned the value of hard work. And my parents, I learned the value of hard work at school too. My parents made, one, made me make one promise to them that I couldn't stay in Orange County for school. They wanted me to understand that there's a bigger world out there. So when I went off to college, I followed their advice. I went to UC Santa Barbara for law school. I went to UC Hastings, excuse me, for UC uh, Santa Barbara undergrad, UC Hastings for law school. But I always intended to come back to Orange County. That was going to be my goal, because this was my home. This is the community that I love. And like I said, I've always had a job. I went from high school to college to law school. I worked all the way through. So when I came home from law school, I thought this might be a chance to have a break. It lasted about two weeks before my parents said, all right, go get a job. And I did. Just by chance, the Orange County DA's office was hiring. And I thought this would be a great opportunity. I loved litigation. But in the civil world, you don't get a lot of trial experience. So I thought, hey, I'd work at the DA's office for a couple years. I'd get a lot of trial experience. And then I'd go off and earn big money in the civil realm. I lasted about three months at the DA's office before I realized I was home. It was the best job. It is the best job. I get to wear the white hat every day. I do the right thing every day. Sometimes that means filing a case, taking a case to trial. Sometimes it means not filing the case at all because it doesn't warrant the criminal justice system getting involved. But I loved it. I started off working general misdemeanors and then I went over to juvenile court where they assigned me to what they like to call the knife and gun club. These were repeat juvenile offenders who had gone through probation many times, and now they committed violent felonies. And I'll tell you, that was incredibly difficult work because it was our job to try to sort through those people, even though they had been through probation before, which ones just needed some correction and which ones were going to be the future monsters. It was hard work, it was challenging work, but I loved it. After that, I went to general felonies, and then I was assigned to the sexual assault unit. And if I thought juvie was tough, the sexual assault unit was like nothing I had experienced. These were the most horrific crimes you can imagine a, one person committing on another. I worked with child victims, I worked with adults, I worked with the elderly. 
it was heartbreaking, but it was rewarding because I was able to every day say, what I am doing is keeping the community safe. After that, I worked in the gang unit for about a year, and then they transferred over to the homicide unit, and that's where I've been for the last going on nine years. I've tried all different kinds of cases, cases involving takeover residential robberies where family members have been executed in front of other family members. I've dealt with kidnap and rapes, dealt with murders. I'm the only prosecutor currently in the Orange County DA's office who is capital qualified, who's done a death penalty case. It was a gentleman who, in, in Southern California, kidnapped, tortured, raped, and murdered five women. Only one of them was in Orange County. The other ones were San Diego, Riverside, and San Bernardino County. Those counties didn't think they had enough to prove it. So we took the case, Orange County took the case, and we said, we'll prove all these murders. And we did. It was a six-month trial. It took a long time. We convicted him, and the jury sentenced him to death row. Like I said, I love this job because it gives me that sense that I'm able to help people. I'm doing something to protect society. About four years ago, a couple judges contacted me, got together, and they said, hey, what's your plan for your next step in your career? And I said, I'm doing what I love. I'm putting bad people away, making a difference. I'm not, this is my career. They said, okay, we'll come and see you again in a couple years. About two years later, they contacted me again. They said, hey, what are you thinking? What's your next step in your career? And I told them, I still like what I'm doing. This is good work. Then about a year ago, they contacted me and said, look, we have an unprecedented opportunity here. What are you thinking? I said, you know what? Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for me to look beyond doing my immediate work and see whether or not I can go to that next level. I want to do something where I can still serve the public. It's a passion of mine. It's something that I've enjoyed doing. And so that's why being a judge appealed to me. The other thing that appealed to me is as the laws have come out of Sacramento, a lot of the discretion that used to be in the hands of prosecutors is now in the hands of judges. And I realized it's more important than ever to have knowledgeable judges, judges who understand the impact of things like when you're deciding to get rid of a strike prior or a gun enhancement or trying to determine what an appropriate sentence is. Not just anyone can do this work. People who have experience in the justice system, people who have seen the impact in the justice system, that's what our community needs. And that's what's led me to run for a judge today. I've heard from time and time again what Orange County needs are good judges. They need hardworking judges. They need judges who not only know the law, but understand the impact of the law. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been my professional career. I've worked hard to know the law. And understand this, something that's important. I work in the criminal realm. An Orange County judge can get assigned anywhere. And they get assigned to family law, they get assigned to civil law, they get assigned to probate. But when I talked to the judges and I asked them, what does that mean? They said, don't worry about it. You're someone who's willing to work hard. You've proven throughout your career that you're willing to study, learn the law, and master the law. You will excel no matter where you go. Here's the hard part about running for judge. It's countywide. It's not by city. It's not by district. It's the entire Orange County. I'm here today to ask you for your vote. I'm asking you to rely on my experience, to rely on who you see, what you see, who I am. But I'm asking you something else as well, because this is the important part about countywide races. I'm not just asking for your vote. I'm asking for you to tell your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, the importance of having good judges in Orange County, the importance of voting for good judges in Orange County. And I'm asking you to not only give me your vote, but to ask your friends, ask your coworkers, ask your neighbors to vote for Eric Scarborough for seat 28. Thank you. Next up, we have an Orange County Assistant District Attorney Christian Duff. 
He has been a prosecutor for over 20 years and currently is the head of the court for Orange County District Attorney's Office in Fullerton, California. Christopher Duff is candidate for Orange County Superior Court Judge Office 9. Welcome him. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Duff. Uh, like my colleague Eric Scarborough, I'm also running for judge. Um, I just wanted to talk a minute about uh, how important it is to vote for judges and be knowledgeable on it, and then I'll talk about myself. But a lot of times, people do not uh, do any type of homework or any type of research on uh, a judge, and it's an incredibly important position. It is effectively a lifetime position. The spot comes up every six years for election, but once you're elected, you basically win over and over. So it's effectively a lifetime spot. So when you're voting for a judge, you have to determine, is this someone I want to be on this bench for effectively the rest of their career? Does that person have the same values that I have? Does that person believe the same things that I believe in? So it's often overlooked, but running for judge is an incredibly important spot that I hope you all consider and put your time and energy into. So, uh, for example, uh, as Eric said, you know, the, the governor appoints a lot of the judges, and you can imagine the type of people that the Governor Newsom appoints. It, that is someone who's not supportive of public safety, law enforcement, any of the things that we support. These people are being let out by these judges, these smash and grab robberies, they're in and out of custody. The day they're arrested, they're out the next day. Imagine the deterrent on that person from committing a new crime when they are arrested and released the very same day. That is not what I believe in. I believe in victim rights, public safety, law enforcement. There is a defendant up in LA who got such a light sentence from uh, the DA up there, Gascon, that he was contemplating having the DA's name tattooed on his forehead. Okay, no one has my name tattooed on their forehead. No one will ever have my name tattooed on their forehead because I was too light on their sentence. Now they may have my name tattooed somewhere else, but it's not gonna be on their forehead. So I want you to consider those things uh, when you're thinking about uh, the position of judge. It's overlooked, but I want to tell you about myself now. I'm, I'm 51. I live in Orange. Uh, I've lived in Orange County most of my life. Uh, I'm married. I have two kids, uh, two dogs, two cats. Uh, that's probably too, too many cats for most people, but my kids like cats. Uh, I've been a prosecutor for about 24 years. I've handled every type of case you could imagine. Murders, gangs, sex crimes. Uh, I've been a special assistant United States attorney uh, on two separate occasions. I've been doing this a long time. Just like Eric, I've seen a lot of bad, bad crime, okay? Crime is coming down from LA. It's changing than when I first got here. When I first arrived in Orange County, it was very uh, public safety, victim rights, law enforcement oriented county. We have to make sure that it goes back to that. Right? I, don't, I believe defendants are entitled to fair rights, just like anyone, but law enforcement, victim rights, public safety has to be tilted back to the same. So we need to make sure that we do that. I'm supported by Sheriff Barnes. I'm, in, I'm supported by almost every law enforcement agency in the county. I'm supported by uh, Michelle Steele. I'm endorsed by the Republican uh, Party of Orange County. I have that support from, from law enforcement because I've always supported victim rights. I've always supported law enforcement. I care about my family. I care about the safety of my family. I care about the safety of all of you. I'm, I'm re reluctant and concerned about the way this county's going. Most of the counties in this state, I believe, are lost. Orange County is not lost. We're still a county that believes in all of these things right here. Family, sanctity of life, national defense, victims' rights, our own safety. I'm concerned that that trickles down to LA because people start to think that they can come down here and commit crimes and be released early for less than the mandatory minimums. I believe that people who commit heinous crimes deserve to be sentenced to the maximum that they deserve. And they've earned that. So a lot of people deserve you know, probation and a fine. But the people who commit horrible crimes in this county, who come down to this county and think that they can get away with it, deserve to be sentenced appropriately. So I hope you support me. I've left some literature outside and some signs. Just like Eric said, it's a county-wide election. I need all of your support. If you can tell your friends and, and help that kind of grow, uh, I appreciate it and thank you for your time.
Next up, we have an owner attorney, Scott Ball and Associates. A, he's a business, he owns a business law firm. Scott has many accolades, including served as California Assemblyman, representing Orange County from 1995 to 2000. He was the chairman of the Orange County Republican Party, 2004 to 2015, and a founding chairman of the Institute for Fair Elections. I'd like you to give you a, everyone to give a warm welcome for Scott Ball, candidate for U.S. Congress in California, right here, 47th District. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. And uh, uh, Christopher, thank you for your comments. Uh, I endorse you. I'm voting for you. A great American. Uh, keep Orange County safe. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, other than what you may already know, uh, as the chairman and as a former member of the legislature and as a uh, Republican leader in the legislature, uh, because it tells you my philosophy about life. Uh, I'm chairman of the Gang Reduction Intervention Partnership. Uh, you guys know about that, you judges, and uh, we work with parents and law enforcement and teachers uh, to keep kids out of gangs. Why? Because keeping them out of gangs is a lot simpler or easier to deal with in stopping crime than trying to get them out of gangs once they've joined. And so we work in a collaboration to do that. We raise money, we do programs for them to keep them out and give them an incentive to stay out of gangs. Also, I was a founding member of Pacifica High School right over here. Um, it's a uh, local high school uh, because I just believe that uh, government doesn't do as good of a job as, as individuals do and as parents do and as uh, citizens do. I'm also the founding chairman of the Orange County Marathon Foundation. We've trained over 50,000 children in the value of nutrition and, and um, uh, exercise, something I don't do as much as I should, but, um, but we, we teach them that because it is important. And uh, so that's my philosophy, that the uh, community should be engaged and should be involved and should control their own destiny. And, and why is that? It's because when government controls your destiny, the outcome isn't very good. We've seen from the founding of our country, what, what made the American dream so beautiful here? Why is the American dream different than the German dream or the Italian dream? It's because, first of all, Americans came to this country as entrepreneurs. They were willing to uproot their entire lives and come to this country. They were willing to sacrifice everything and go through tremendous hardship. Many of them died in order to create a better life. And that is the heritage that we have. But equally important, we also have a country that was designed for the first time in the history of mankind. We had a country that was designed to promote the individual, to allow the individual to flourish. Our country wasn't founded to serve the king or the tyrant or the uh, dictator or the general. It was designed to serve the individual, to allow the individual to flourish. And something has happened in the, uh, the years since uh, our country was founded. And I might say that, you remember the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world? Um, what did the British and what did the, if the media were aground, today, if CNN were around today, what would they call those people? They would call them belligerents and uneducated and stupid and criminals and thugs. They would call them all these things because they were challenging the establishment. And we have come full circle in this country, a long history. We, we, weren't, we weren't perfect, but we were aspirational in our founding. We went through our civil war. We came through civil rights. And in the 70s, how many of you in the 70s, I was growing up, I was in grade school and high school, I was afraid of what? Nuclear war. We were, well, and quicksand. Uh, all, all, all of the shows had quicksand in them. We, you know, I talk to kids today, they don't even know what quicksand is. They're not afraid of it. But we all grew up afraid of quicksand, right? And, um, uh, but nuclear war and the welfare state. And we could not understand. It was a fight between liberals and conservatives. And of course, thanks to Ronald Reagan and his policies, we, we won that battle and the Soviet Union went, fell apart. And, and then we also had the Gingrich Revolution and, and the welfare state kind of dissipated a bit. We had a lot of governors doing welfare reform. And so I thought the two things that I was afraid of It's okay, I can talk over that. Or do you want to stop it? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so the two things that, that we grew up fearing, I mean, if you're older than 50, 60, it's like you, you realize these things were there and we were able to like, wow, the world can get better. And that's what I do believe about America. It can always get better. We are down, but we're going to come back because we were born in that entrepreneurial spirit. And we were born to allow the individual to, to flourish. But then something else happened. The left started getting a hold of our institutions, our education. They started changing everything from the core. And so now instead of fighting liberalism versus conservative, we're fighting conservatism versus socialism and wokeism and, and whatever else ism you want to talk about. Because the progressives in this country are no longer hiding. They're not ashamed. They want to destroy the American way of life. They want to destroy the free enterprise system. So in 1994, when the left wanted to socialize medicine and increase taxes, what happened? The American people said, no, that's not us. And we picked up 54 seats in Congress, had the Newt Gingrich agenda. And then in 2010, what happened? If you remember, Obamacare and more tax increases. And what happened? The American people said, no, that's not what we're about. So we picked up 63 seats in Congress. And during the Obama administration, we picked up over 700 legislative seats throughout the country. And that was when we had an enthusiasm gap that was huge. Well, friends, this year the enthusiasm gap is monumental. NBC poll, NBC poll recently had it at 17%. Now, when NBC says the enthusiasm gap is at 17%, you know the Democrats are in real trouble, right? And the last time it was at 17%, we did pick up those 63 seats. And that's what the American people but the, are feeling now. But the difference is this. Instead of socializing medicine, the left is now trying to socialize everything. They want to take over the entire country and they want to destroy the free enterprise system. They are collectivists. They want everybody to be the same. They want the same class, the same race, the same gender. They want, they, there's no distinction anymore. Hard work, delayed gratification, all those things that are hallmarks of success in getting a step forward, they think are vestiges of white privilege. And that's what they're using to divide this country. They divide us by race, they divide us by class, they divide us by gender. Well, the American people are smarter than that, and they've said, you know what? We get your gig. We're not doing this anymore. That's why Biden's approval's down in the 40s, and, and the enthusiasm gap is so big. And I don't know how many seats we're going to pick up in Congress, but one of them's going to be right here in Costa Mesa, because... Because our, our opponent does not represent the values of what we are here in this community. And so um, it's not going to be easy. They have a lot of money. But bear in mind, they had a lot of money last time. They had $25 million last time, and Michelle still spent $10 million. And who won? Michelle still, right? They had $25 million against Young Kim. And she spent about $10 million, and Young Kim won. So money isn't everything as long as the people come out, as long as you come out and vote, and as long as you put yard signs in your yard, as, as long as you participate. Because listen, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, and this is the price we have to pay to enjoy the prosperity that this country has given us. We've all lived the American dream. Let's go out and fight and reclaim it for the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Before we have a short intermission, we're going to give Leo Zaki a chance to running for governor of California. Thank you very much for having me here today, guys. Um, for those of you who don't know me, because I know probably about half the room at this point, uh, my name is Leo Zaki, and if you recognize the last name Zaki, you should, because that is the same Zaki that Zaki Farms is, the chicken company. Yeah, so a little bit of name recognition. Um, so I'm running for a whole host of reasons because California, after 90 years, killed my family's business. We went from being the largest poultry producer on the West Coast and the largest privately owned employer in the state of California to being out of business in just a few short years. Because poor people, uh, poor legislative decisions by poor individuals have forced businesses to go under. 
whether it's overregulation, environmental restrictions, high cost of utilities, uh, the high business taxes, and of course the ever increasing minimum wage, it forced it put us in a position where our fixed costs were so high that we were unable to be competitive with folks that were producing on the other side of the country. So at, while I was working for my family, I was also part of the California Poultry Federation, which is a lobbying organization. So I would go to D.C. and Sacramento several times a year, and I'd meet with congressmen and senators, state reps, state assembly, USDA, FDA. And I quickly discovered that these people are not smart, and they don't care about you, and they certainly don't care about the state or the businesses in it. But they really, really love being driven around, having a driver and a chauffeur, and being told how special they are. So I've seen the corruption firsthand. These, these people don't care about you. And um, I, that's one of the things that really got me motivated to do this. Uh, I remember meeting a congressman one time, and he was so excited to tell us how he'd been elected four or five times and he'd never voted on a single thing. I mean, it's things like that that are, are putting our country in just the toilet. And that's where we are right now. We're getting just decimated by just poor people who don't care. And they don't care about you, they don't care about anything. So I want to expose corruption at its core. That's really the biggest thing holding us back. And California has a whole host of issues. And I can list them all off, but and I'd rather just bring solutions to the table. So I will. So it starts here with water. Water is it's the foundation block of life. And for California, our agriculture industry is what makes us the world's fifth largest economy. And we need to have water for our farmers. Right now, the water allocation for our farmers in the Central Valley is 1.65 cubic feet per acre. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but it means a hell of a lot to farmers. And I'll just give you some context here that to sustain citrus, not let it thrive, sustain it, you need 2.25 cubic feet per acre. So that's a bit of a problem. So we're seeing the American dream be decimated here in California because folks are literally unable to, to grow their crops. And when they can't grow their crops, they can't bring in any money and they can't take care of their families, so they have two choices. Sell or go broke. So what you're seeing is a lot of small independent farmers go out of business and they're getting bought up by conglomerates or folks like Bill Gates and even uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party are buying up lots of farmland here in California. So we have to put a stop to that by helping uh, get water back to these folks. And we're going to do that by building reservoirs at the high altitudes to capture the snowpack, which we're not currently doing. We need to build out desalinization facilities uh, because that's what we need to do. And we also have to upgrade our existing water infrastructure. And my long-term goal for California is to make us a water exporter, which will bring revenue into the state without coming out of your, your pocket. It's really simple, but we just have to do it. And anything we do on a large enough scale will be, uh, will be affordable because the more you do it, it's, it's just uh, from my manufacturing background. The more you produce, the lower your costs per unit is. And anyways. So everybody is upset with the homeless crisis. That's probably something that you guys are more familiar with uh, living in the urban areas. It's where well, we have to go to the root cause of the issue. And the root cause is it's a mental health crisis compounded with a drug addiction exacerbated by a failed education system. So by going after the root causes, that's how we're going to fix it. So I'd like to take a page out of Sheriff Arpaio's book and do what he did with the tent cities and put them, provide them facilities outside of the cities and we're going to get them there by enforcing our vagrancy laws because we have not been doing that. So we have to enforce our vagrancy laws, give them the option to go into this program. Uh, otherwise, they're going to go to jail, they'll wind up in the program, or they can go and live that lifestyle outside of the cities. But when they're there, they'll receive treatment for their mental health crisis, for their drug addiction, and they'll get a job skill. So they'll either get a job skill in uh, sanitation or agriculture, construction, or basic firefighting. They'll, learn, they'll get on-the-job training, they'll earn money, put it into their pocket, and um, when they're ready to leave the program, they'll have money in their pocket, they'll be eligible for government-assisted housing, and any company that hires them coming out of the program will receive a tax incentive. So um, as I'm running out of time here, I just wanted to say that there is corruption. If I mention names like Bill Gates or George Soros or Klaus Schwab, does that mean anything to you guys? Yes. Okay. Well, if we know those are the people behind all the things that are destroying our country, we have to expose them and go after them, and I will do that relentlessly. Uh, with your help and your support, I will have the bully pulpit here and the whole world will get to hear me and the truth about what's going on in the world. And that's how we stop this. Let's take down the deep state and save this nation. Thank you so much. And finally, candidate for governor. It gives me great honor 
to introduce you to Jenny Ray LaRoe. Jenny Ray is an accomplished business owner, author, and strategic advisor with a BA in economics from the University of Virginia and an MBA from Columbia Business School. Jenny Ray is a frequent presenter at Harvard Business School, the Wharton School of Business, and over 60 other top institutions. Please give it up for Jenny Ray LaRoe. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to be here. I'm gonna pass around some rack cards and envelopes. Take one if you want one, and especially if you're gonna give money tonight, thank you. Um, I'm gonna hopefully inspire you to make that d good decision in a little bit. I'm Jenny Ray LaRue, I'm running for governor of California, and do you like our current governor? That's my one question that I begin with. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm in the same boat, and um, I originally kind of figured out what the governor does and what he's about at the beginning of COVID. Like a lot of moms in the state who are out of the mix, I'm in the mix now because my kids got affected by what happened in the schools. But even more than that, the kids of other parents in our community got affected. So I'm going to just tell you a quick story, and then we're going to move on to who I am, why I'm the one to get this done, and what we need to do next. Uh, first of all, at the beginning of COVID, uh, my kids are in a public school. It's a charter school where they learn Spanish, and it's a heavily Hispanic population in the school. And what we discovered at the first two-week mark of COVID is that about 60% of our kids weren't logging in to school. And so the teachers in the school went around and tried to figure out why this was. And they discovered that a lot of the parents of the kids were essential workers, and the kids were home alone. Five years old, home alone. Six years old, home alone. Because what do you do if you're an essential worker and your school is closed and you can't go anywhere? Right? It was this gap in policy that politicians put in place where they didn't think about families and kids anymore. And that was what woke me up, got me out of my stupor. And historically, I have been as far away from government as I could be as a business person. I learned very early on that if the government's involved in your business, it's not a good thing. Uh, but here, I just recognize government has chased us down in every area of our life. They chase my kids in through the school and they're chasing them in curriculum right now. They chased us in our business with fees and regulation and changes to the way that we can operate that are strangling our business. My family and I seven years ago bought a family farm. That family farm is constrained by water and wildfire issues, things that the government can and should do something about but refuses to. And so the crystallization of me doing this came actually in a conversation in a bar in Los Angeles. Um, I sat down with a Mormon, a labor union worker, and an artist. Doesn't that sound like the beginning of a joke, right? <laughs> and, uh, and when they found out that I was a Republican, they were A, astonished, and B, angry. And I, I, you may have experienced this from other people, but one, the guy who's the artist acted as a, as a mediator in our conversation, and he said, let's ask one key question. What do we all think good government looks like? What is good government? And so I'll tell you what my answer was. Good government provides goods and services for people to live in freedom. So they protect us in our property rights from one another, from somebody stealing your house from you while you're sleeping. They ensure that we provide law and order in society, safety and community and people who cannot live under those rules, they go to jail or they can't live with other people anymore. We provide for education to prepare the workforce of the future. And it got us in the conversation down back to the basics of what we all want in California, which is what I believe the people in our state are crying out for because the people who are leaving are not just conservatives. They're people who do not want to live in our state anymore because we have degraded the quality of life here. And so I'll talk really quickly about my issues and then finally I wanna share how we're gonna get this done. Inside the state of California, the voters are telling us what they want in this election cycle. They told us in the recall, if you look at the data, that the number one reason people voted no on the recall is they thought the economy was fine in California. Now they don't think the economy is fine. They want us to fix gas prices. They want us to make their lives more affordable and they're worried about inflation. And the good news is that a good government can do that. It can unleash the constraints on our economy and do that immediately. So on day one, I would suspend the gas tax in California, put 51 cents back in the pocket of everyone who's driving around and it would make a difference in conservative wallets and everywhere else. Yeah, you can clap about that. Yeah, come on. Mm -mm. 
practical, tactical action that makes a difference for people. Uh, the second thing that matters to me is crime and homelessness. So Gavin Newsom's plan for crime is close prisons and put criminals on the street. I think it's a very bad plan, and we're seeing the effects of it. In addition, his plan for homelessness is spend money creating permanent housing for people. Because the implication of that is that he believes the problem with homelessness is housing. It's not. The problem with homelessness is mental health and drug abuse and aimlessness for people that aren't working. And so we can't create enablement structures that focus on permanent housing. We have to create temporary housing and services to get people out of that lifestyle and back into work. And the third thing that I care about is education. I, like Cordy, have young kids. My uh, oldest is nine years old. My next one is in kindergarten. These kids are the kids of the future of California. And there is nothing that mama bears will do except anything for their kids, right? Everything that is on the line is for our kids. So, um, so we're going to talk about education, not just about how to remove CRT in our schools and how to raise standards, but also how do we unleash the workforce of the future? We give them tools for entrepreneurship, STEM, the arts, and we give them the options to do those kind of things. Uh, and then finally, infrastructure. So um, infrastructure is the thing that nobody thinks is sexy, but we all start to notice when it goes away, like when power is off or when wildfires are out of control, or when we don't have enough water, then we notice that somebody didn't pay attention to infrastructure. And so I will spend the surplus that we have today instead of how Gavin Newsom spends it, which is on government programs like walking around your neighborhood, knocking on your door and finding out whether you're vaccinated, I will spend them on the water, the power, and the ecological systems of the future. All right? How's that sound? You guys want to live in that California? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've been a fighter all my life. I've been somebody who's broken glass ceilings and I've done the impossible before. This is an impossible race. And the media would tell you it, it is actually even unwise to run. There's no point to run. Um, but how many of you played sports at some point in your life? All right, awesome. Um, what's the best defense? Good offense, right? So we need to paint Gavin Newsom backward into a corner, and here's how I think we can get it done. We lose most elections by somewhere around 12 points of a differential between 50% and where we land, around 38%. So we have to close that gap, and it's math to do it. The number one way that we can do that is by focusing on the issues that people care about. The economy is that issue. We focused historically on taxes because we thought that was what they were talking about. That's not. We're talking about real pocketbook kitchen table issues. So that's number one. That's 4%. And every time Joe Biden opens his mouth, he gives me one extra percent. So that's really encouraging and helpful for us right now. Uh, the second thing that we can do is make sure that we have, and that's basically about having the right message, right? And it's, it, it is a little bit different for different groups. For some, it's education. For some, it's crime. But it's focusing on the issues that are not the pure conservative issues. I'm a pro-life, pro-Second Amendment candidate, but those people are voting with us anyhow. We need to reach the issues that are beyond that. Um, the second piece is that we need to have the right messenger. The second reason that people told us that they didn't vote for us in the recall is that they were scared of Larry Elder. So if you see everything that's on my website, site. Larry Elder's not scary, but, but he did have a lot of tough-looking pictures. One of the first things that my consultants told me, and I thought this was wise and, and out-of-the-box thinking, they said, if you're running red in a blue state, you need to be a happy mom, not a mad mom. Because people don't know whether you're mad at them or whether you're mad at the establishment when they look at the picture. And I thought that was incredibly powerful. So Newsom is going to have a much harder time attacking a happy mom. Why? Because his base that got him elected is women. And guess who's going to get him unelected in the fall? Women as well. OK, so happy mom, the right messenger reaching out into the communities that we haven't reached out to before. Um, the last piece is money. It's brute force. Uh, I, I did a Hispanic radio station last week. And afterwards, I asked the guy behind the recording what he thought of it. because. I didn't know whether he was on our team or not. I had no idea. And, and I said, what did you think? He said, you said one thing that was really interesting to me, and then I have one thing to tell you. He said, what I heard from you is that you said Gavin Newsom could do it, but won't. And I was talking about the gas tax suspension. Gavin Newsom could make your gas cheaper, but won't. He said, that's the message for Hispanics. That's what we need to hear. It's that simple and that easy. 
Um, and I said, okay, awesome, I can do that. I can have the message discipline to talk about that. I said, what did you want to tell me? He said, in our radio station, we play 20 dem, dem ads for every one Republican ad. 20 to one, that's money. That's a basic equation. If we don't spend the money, they don't hear our message. Right? And so we have to spend the money outside of the conservative base and our Republican Party in order to adopt those voters. And if we do, we can win in those markets. Um, I'll just finish with this. In Virginia, one of the keys to the win there was keeping a totally conservative candidate focused on disciplined central issues and spending money outside the party for suburban women and Asian Americans. In addition, in California, it's Hispanics. And so if you didn't get the envelopes yet and you, and you uh, want one, give me some money tonight, anything, but put some skin in the game. Join me so that I can get this message out to other people. Because what we need to do is make sure that the candidate that wins in the primary is one that's going to stick it to Newsom in the fall. And that person is me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank <laughs> you.